Hey, bodyholics, welcome back to the cutting edge of well being where honesty and science collide to ignite your health revolution. This is Decaf Shachal, your host, and I'm pumped to kick off another episode with you badass information and truth seekers. Before we dive into today's seriously fascinating conversation, let me just remind you that your body is a temple and bodyholic.fit is your sacred training ground. Build your physique, fuel your mind, and conquer your goals with any one of over 1,000 workouts on the site combined with expert guidance. Remember that you're only one workout away from a better you. And if you're dealing with commitment issues, worry not. You can find plenty of Bodyholic workouts on YouTube. And when you are ready for us to train together day by day, the Bodyholic community awaits at bodyholic.fit. Now, buckle up because today we're cracking the code on personalized health with the one and the only Dr. Jeremy Koenig. Dr. Koenig is not your average scientist. He's a trailblazer. He's kind of the trailblazer master of DNA. He's the architect of DNA as a service, DAS, which is basically like unlocking the secrets of your own personal instruction manual. Plus, he's built the Iris OS, a performance framework used by world-class athletes and ordinary folks just like you and me to unleash our inner champions. Dr. Koenig is a powerhouse of knowledge, a business whiz, and he's also a client success champ. You are about to hear some serious information about the future of healthcare hacking your biology, and optimizing your performance for a life that's anything but ordinary. So, are you ready to dive into the cutting edge of personalized health with Dr. Jeremy Koenig? Hit that subscribe button, whether you're on YouTube or Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to be a pal and share the knowledge as well. Let's dive in. So, Dr. Jeremy Koenig, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, it really, for me, it really is a pleasure because this is one of the um, only episodes that I've been doing in the last, uh, right now, I mean, I'm literally counting the days, 52 days because I'm in Israel and it's been very um, tense where I am. And I'm just like, yeah, let's let's just talk about what I always love to talk about and well-being and health and optimization. We're going to get into all that. So I'm loving uh, the fact that we're just having a conversation about this right now and uh, not about tension and politics and war and all that stuff. So mm. um, let's get into that good stuff. What I want to first of all touch on what motivated you to pursue a career in the field of genomics and human potential optimization. Yeah, which I'm not sure everybody really actually is familiar with the latter, and so I would I would love it if you would elaborate. Yeah. Um. So the. Let me just give you the short answer and then I'll give you some definitions. So the short answer to how does somebody go into genomics and, you know, sharpening the spear of um, human potential uh, is, well, I, I don't know. It just it kind of happened. Dumb luck, you know. <laughs> so it, but but, you know, at the center of that, it's doing what you love. Um, and uh, that really came about from. You know, ever since I ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete of some kind. Um, and ever since I was a kid, my 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 mom and my my neighbors and everybody told me, you're, you know, you're going to be a doctor. So um, <laughs> certainly, certainly environment had something to to do with it. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's the, the there's the you know, lar largely emotional influences, I would say, um, that came in and around my, my teens, um, 
particularly my mom got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, so, you know, she came home and, and said, uh, you know, hey, I have this disease and they don't know if it's genetic or not. It might be, it might not be. You might get it, you might not get it. So, you know, there's, you know, fear for losing your mother. There's fear for your own life. There's fear for, you know, you're just talking about children. There's fear, fear for your children's life. Um, and we don't even know if it's, um, you know, genetic or environmental, um, as is the case with with so many things. And um, so, so that's on the, call it the urgency around like, well, here's why it's important to learn it because it can save lives. Um, but then when you, you know, in parallel to um, doing my studies, uh, I, I was also um, a track athlete. So I did many sports beforehand. Um, I just landed on track in, in, in college because it seemed to me it was a one sport that was socially acceptable to spend 20 hours a week on while I you mm -hmm. know, got to pursue my passion in academia. So I got to be this pseudo professional athlete. Right. And I, and I took it really seriously. You know, I was captain of the track team. I was a sprinter. There's zero margin for error. And I went as far as the um, Canadian Olymp Olympic trials and the, the sprint events, um, 100 meters in particular. So so you, you start to see like I'm, I'm studying DNA and I'm and I'm and I'm working at being an athlete. And, and uh, you know, while we would learn about, you know, conventional studies, for example, of like here's how to look at DNA. I was constantly looking at it through this human performance lens. Um, so to come back and, and define a couple of things that you were, terms that you used off the bat. So that you said genomics, and then I think you said- um, Human optimi potential optimization. That's right, human potential optimization, right. So so um, first of all, genomics, like the differentiation between genomics and genetics is a crit critical differentiation. So you know, genetics comes down to like the single- gene influences if you will or the genotype profile you might have or you know if you use these um these uh uh direct to consumer um products like your 23andme or ancestry they're they're speaking of single genes and so that's like your genetic profile as it relates to these single nucleotide polymorphisms and uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism just means there's um a high enough frequency of this DNA mutation in different populations, such that it is an anomaly. It, or sorry, it is it is is a quantifiable phenomenon. So, you know, my blue eyed allele, my allele for blue eyes versus yours for brown. I can't tell if you're brown or not. I can see a glass on or green. <laughs> green. <laughs> so, so those are those are point mutations. Let's call it that can be measured. Um, so that's you know genetics, and there's you know, billions of markers. Genomics is really more to do with how does the entire genome, um, and, and not just the human genome, by the way, there's like every species has a genome. Um, how does the entire genome evolve in a really holistic, synergistic way? And so that's when you start to get into, uh, you know, topics like, well, gene expression profiles, right? Epigenetics. Um, it's a, it's a vast topic for, um, conversation that, that, that could li literally go on for days if we, if we had the time. Um, and, you know, effectively that was my, my passion in leading up to, to grad school. So I did meta genomics. So very, very meta, um, you can probably guess by, like, by the way that I'm speaking is, you know, I, I um, was heavily influenced by my philosopher and I, who is very much I'm sorry, my supervisor is very much a philosopher and, you know, I studied um, philosophy as well because, you know, what I learned is it's 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 so important to be asking the right questions um, when we're looking at something like DNA, which is both our shared heritage and our shared future and every living thing has this. Um, so, so genomics is a really big, big topic. Um, when I think about human potential, uh, it's it's really more about, you know, when I think about the work that I did, um, there's the discrete like application of it, which, which came from, uh, the work that I did with athletes, but I, I should probably just say, uh, you know, because you asked, how did you get into this? Well, I, I finished my PhD and I, and I, I did my, my postdoc, um, actually at Cornell studying under, um, Jeffrey Gordon's postdoc, Ruth Lay, who pioneered the human microbiome research. 
Um, and so actually my first project in my postdoc was comparing the human gut microbiome to <clears throat> genetics. And actually I did the first um, infant case study of how the, 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 the gut, human gut microbiome is colonized. Um, so I was really starting to look mechanistically how um, the human is this holistic being and this interface of things that are going on. And, and so it was literally like, you know, when, when like Neo, if you ever watched the matrix, like Neo could kind of like yeah. wake up and you can see the matrix. So it's like, I kind of had like an aha moment like that, um, where it's just, everything looked so different and connected and you, and, and you could really, you know, sense it. And, um, you know, th then one day I was, there I was advancing on my, um, academic career. And by this point, you know, after my postdoc, I was a professor in nutrigenomics, but, um, but I got recruited to do uh, longevity research and, and actually reproductive longevity research. Um, and I did that for a while. And that was my first exposure to industry uh, all before then, the 20 years or so that it took me to, you know, to realize that first academic career, um, you know, kind of blinded me to what you might do in industry. And, um, and so I had that industry experience looking at fertility and reproduction of um, actually there were these, 10 population of um, mice that were selectively bred for 10 years to enhance reproductive lifespan. And, and it was successful to the extent that uh, it would be analogous to women being able to have babies till they're 120, let's say. Mm. So my job was to figure out the genetics of that. And I did, and it was interesting, it was amazing, and, and it, it blew my mind. And, and I thought, well, wow, that's that's really, you know, performance at the highest level. <laughs> you know, we were talking at the beginning of the call right. is, is making life. Um, but this kind of called me to my two passions, right? Like athletics and genetics. Um, and that's what led me to found um, Athletogen, which was essentially DNA of, of human performance. And uh, so that's that's how that kind of came together. It was not what I was aiming at at the beginning, but um, the truth is I, you know, I never stopped being an athlete. I was always, um, you know, participating in different events and always thinking about, you know, individual physiology and and then also like seeing this bigger interconnected um world of uh nature and nurture so so that's the kind of the long way around of how i got to um you know dna and performance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um about six times uh throughout listening to you i was like we need to do a an episode about that we need to do an episode about that <laughs> And that and that <laughs> squirrel. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, because I mean, it's 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 a lot, and um, it's all like a world on its own. Like each yeah. each topic. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> so, I, I want us to touch on on two concepts. Mm -hmm. One is the DNA as a service. Mm -hmm. um, which, which I love that instead of data as a service. Um, mm -hmm. and, and do you call that DAS? I mean, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yes. I, I guess for short term, yes, you would call it DAS. DAS good. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one is, is that is DNA as a service and how it, it can empower individuals to make informed decisions about their health and performance. Mm -hmm. That's that's one part to, to focus on the DNA as a service. And if you could touch on the Iris, I, um, Iris OS, did I mm -hmm. say that right? Yep, yep. Um, because it's specifically designed for performance and coaching for entrepreneurs. That's so right. I feel like it's, it's kind of like taking it to the next level. Right. Right. Yeah. So if yeah. you could kind of uh, give me like, just like I gave you a two part question, like a two part answer to that. For sure. And remind me, how much time do we have? How? <laughs> <laughs> I love how you ask <laughs> the timing of the question. No, no, no. We're good to go. You feel okay. free. Yeah. I want to be respectful to users and, or sorry, users. Um, you can see where my head's at. Listeners. Listeners and, and, and <laughs> your time, of course. Um yeah, DNA as a service. Um, DNA as a service was an idea that came to me um, as I was working on my my first um, 
well, it's actually really my second DNA enterprise, if you will. The first one, it was performance genomics, and that was the longevity and reproductive um, reproductive longevity. Athletogen was the second one. Um, and Athletogen was the project where, you know, I looked into the molecules of 10,000 plus athletes, right? And discovered these amazing, amazing insights. You know, in particular, this these discoveries were made with, with Olympians. Um, and I, I found, uh, you know, let's just say three main insights that I thought, you know, would be of service, let's say, to 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 the athletes. Um, and, and these will make sense. So generally speaking, when I looked at athletes who are competing at an Olympic level, so these are mostly over the age of 20, 25, they survived the NCAA training, let's say, right? So all the, you know, it's, it's hard to be an athlete. I mean, the, to, to come through on skate without injury is, right. right? That's like, you'd, you might say it's a fluke. It's like, no, actually it's not. Because as I looked at the DNA, there's an over-representation of athletes with injury protection alleles. So that's really interesting. Number one, right? So number two uh, was, well, if you've ever worked out with somebody, you might notice that they get gains faster than you, you know, say that you lift weights, they put on muscle faster, you go for runs, they get fitter, their aerobic capacity increases quicker, you do high intensity interval training, you know, maybe you're faster than all of them, but there's, there's a spectrum of, of response to training, um, you know, just in the way that there's a spectrum in response to pharmaceuticals. So, and we prescribe, we prescribe minimum effective dose. Same thing is true in training. What's the minimum effective mm -hmm. dose? Mm -hmm. reality is if you're an athlete it's like honestly train the least amount possible because every time you go out to train if you're training properly by the way it's you're employing this overreaching strategy strategic overreaching um to the point that you're flirting with injury um every time so the less you can train the better this whole no pain no gain thing while true it's like even that needs a minimum effective dose mm -hmm. uh, then the third thing was you know there's the chronic fatigue the burnout the training plateaus um and uh, and that you know I could lend it th th those insights lended itself to uh, basically your nutrigenomic profile or suite of genes you know so athletes who well for exa example were burdened with soreness um, more so than you know controls uh, had uh, overrepresentation of the unfavorable allele associated with vitamin C metabolism people that you know suffered um, burn burnout or fatigue or de decreased mood had a decreased ability to uh, absorb vitamin D. So it was like, you know, hundreds uh, of these um, genes put together in, in an infinite number of com combinations that made up the individual athlete. Um, and so giving coaches that information at the right time, you know, allowed for a critical decision uh, that in the case of the athlete would mean an Olympic medal. Um, so DNA as a service uh, in, in this way, is a tool that allows, well, um, if we look at it through the lens of the athlete, it's to know myself, you know, which is, you mm -hmm. know, essentially what a lot of the athletic journey is about. If you watch any of these, you know, athlete montages, is they, they struggle and they find themselves, they find their way. And well, how do they do that? They do that mostly through trial and error. Um, their coaches do that mostly through trial and error. So, Look, there's always going to be trial and error, but if we give people um, DNA insights in some regard, we're saying, here's where the quicksand is and you can avoid this. So I can say, mm -hmm. hey, you have a you have a, a predisposition to rupture your Achilles tendon. You've chosen to be a triple jumper. I'm not telling you to not do that, um, but here are some exercises um, that you can do to lengthen and strengthen. Here's some nutrition that you can undertake. Here's the, the, the training volume protocols that are going to be unique to you compared to your bulletproof training partner. Right. So, so DNA as a service is essentially, um, uh, it, it's a, it's a compass that individuals can now use to guide decisions throughout their lives. And I'm not talking just um, Olympic performances. I mean, they're, those are great. And those are really fun. Those are really fun projects to do. Um, but this becomes a tool that you can imagine as uh, being important uh, in terms of identifying, you know, risk stat carrier status with parents trying to conceive, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, IVF, uh, for for example. Um, you know, there's there are now um, you know infant 
uh, diagnostics, rare diagnostic diseases, where it's like, you know, one in 10 infants present with some kind of rare disease. Um, and, and by the way, rare disease in general is one out of 10 people have one. So it's actually about a billion people on the planet have it. That's, that's a lot. So now the idea of DNA as a service is such that um, it, it, require, it requires infrastructure, right? So in, that, that's you know where we see software as a service, like Microsoft. They have to build the whole software infrastructure uh, and a platform to deploy these approaches to software development, like the agile process. But you know they have to have a following and a base to to make it economically viable. Um, I think what we're going to see in the future with genetics is like, look for a thousand different DNA companies to start up, it's going to be, I mean, I can tell you from experience, it's, you know, it's probably can be done for a lot cheaper now, but when I did it, it was, you know, it was about $5 million to start up. Right. So mm -hmm. how do we amortize those startup costs? It's like, well, there are now these companies that are emerging um, that can offer these DNA insights um, with these robust bioinformatic platforms um, that have done a lot of that heavy lifting already. Right. Um, so sequencing.com, as you know, that's a company I work with today. Um, right. They have an incredible platform to, you know, essentially Google your genome, so to speak. Like they've developed mm -hmm. software as Genome Explorer, where if you have some kind of a priori knowledge about your condition, you can actually search your genome or view your genome ranked based on your risk scores. If you're somebody that is going to be proactive and, and essentially take that into consideration. I mean, it, it could change your life, right? I mean, that's something mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, when I look at through that lens, when I look through that lens, now I'm thinking about what are all the things that I can do to extend my, um, you know, my health span, given that I have a daughter, for example. Um, but, and so let's say you get past like the, the major um, stumbling blocks in terms of, um you, you know predispositions like one thing for me is like um on the rare disease side is is a um like likelihood of hearing loss noise induced hearing loss mm -hmm. right so i'd love to hear my daughter sing in 10 or 20 years so that means like no loud music for me right so you know that be means being super vigilant if i get an ear infection um and uh you know there are many many more um, issues that are important to me, like, uh, or, or that are important for me to know, like drug interactions, for example. Um, so I'm, you know, aware now of five or 10 different drugs that I would have adverse reaction to that I can share that information with my physician. Um, and then having this information um, for my daughter before she has to experience um, any adverse um, reaction to something that could have been avoided, whether that be mm -hmm. through food or medication. Um, so, so DNA as a service at its core is making this information um, available to the masses and, and, and affordable, which, I mean, it's amazing. If you think about first human genome sequence was, I, I, you know, I can't remember how much it was. Let's call it a billion dollars at least, like um, at least hundreds of millions for just one genome. And now you can get, you know, your whole genome sequence for $399. Like it's. it's yeah, that's. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. So just, yeah, to quickly summarize this, D DNA as a service is affordable um, DNA insights for the world. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and then going to the second part, and, and the reason I, I'm saying both of them is because I feel like, like I mentioned before, one goes uh, in depth a little bit more uh, than the other in terms of uh, touching on performance and coaching for specifically entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and yeah. and uh, change makers. So yeah, if you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I noticed um, as an entrepreneur um and and solopreneur right so i was a a solo founder um is that the journey is um i mean it's hard i mean like anything worth doing is hard i don't complain about hard work um but it's really really lonely 
Um, and, uh, and it's not, I don't think it's any, it's what anybody's, tra- nobody's trained for it, you know? So you go to, you know, you go to school and, um, I mean, as I look back on the curriculum, it's like, well, I'm basically just trained to, to have a nine to five job with, you know, like a 15 minute break after about two hours and my hour break at uh, the four hour mark and then another 15 break. And then I, you know, I punch out and I leave my job at work and then I go home on the weekend and then I'm, you know, it's up to me to figure out work, work life balance. And I, I don't know if you can ever really get work life balance between a job that you're not passionate about. So you know, first, the first, you know, call it assumption here is, you know, the entrepreneurs I work with are passionate about their jobs. So, so then it becomes about, you know, work-life integration. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of work-life balance uh, per se, but, but work and life integration. So, you know, what, but so, so what do I mean by that is, um, as an entrepreneur, you can get hyper-focused on, the prize, right? So, well, what is that? Is that raising capital? Is that your product launch? Is that, you know, specific metrics or targets that your board is holding you to? Um, you know, are you trying to do Series A? Or are you trying to do an M&A? Are you trying to exit? So there's there's all these, you know, really big, hairy, audacious goals that that you're aiming at and, um, you know, even in, encouraged to pursue at all costs. Um, so encouraged by investors and encouraged by your own staff. Like they, they want to see that, you know, you would push through and give it your all for the sake of the vision, because, you know, it's, it's probably a worthy vision. Um, but you know, the reality is, um, if you win and you're by yourself, that's not a win, you know? So, Mm. so there is, the results that are obviously critical and what you promised to do, but then there's the relationships, right? So are you taking those into consideration as you, you know, stumble uh, aggressively and, and um, you know, with, with your best of will towards your, your outcome of, of, of greatness. And um, so there's, the place that I start is, is the relationship with yourself, right? Um, you know, so are you, are you respecting yourself? Do you know yourself? Do you know the basics in, in biology? So, so I think about like my training is, you know, largely in, um, you know, evolutionary biology, you know, molecular biology, biochemistry, and there are just certain first principles, um, that we've got to get in order right away. Um, so, so I should back up and say the iris operating system is designed for call it change makers, creators, you know, effectively people who want to do good in the world. And and I'm I mostly seem to be attracting people working in health technology, but I don't exclusively work with health technology entrepreneurs. Just like that's where I've been, that's what I understand, that's who I seem to attract. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it tend, tends to be founders, um, you know, say ages like late twenties to fifties. Um, seems to be the, the demographic founders reaching out um and having success so so it's a it's a three-step system designed to help um creators manage their energy and um you know integrate their their passion into their with their relationship so three step there's the biology there's the mindset and uh and then there's the performance planning so the biology leverage is Hey, 4.2 billion years of evolution. You're just not going to get away from it. So let's accept certain things in terms of, uh, you know, hard reality. Like you're not going to get away from, you know, running away from sleep, for example. Right. So as much as you Mm. can tell yourself you can work, you know, four hours and be productive, it's like, yeah, I mean, (laughs) you get your, it's not sustainable. Um, But what is sustainable is if you actually look across, you know, how energy is regulated throughout the day. Um, you know, there are very discrete patterns that are that are wave-like and that you can track and that I have tracked in, in my big quantified self days uh, in terms of when are your maximal and, and um, uh, minimal, um, call it peaks for heart rate variability, which basically correlates well with your ability to be like on your feet, creative, um, and uh and, and productive so so it's really about defining where are the entrepreneur's peaks there's usually a double peak 
um, and then recognizing the troughs and putting the appropriate activities in the appropriate buckets. Um, mm -hmm. And when you do that in a day, you start to do that seven days a week, you start to do that four weeks a month, you start to do that 12 weeks a year, all of a sudden you don't even realize that it's possible to do exponentially more work than you were doing before um, in a way that honors your your biology. So that's that's really step one um, is bringing the awareness to that, getting getting founders recharged um, right away. So like generally when founders come to me, they'll, they'll say, you know, like I, I feel like I'm not as smart as I was. I'm tired all the time. My body's falling apart. My friends don't like me anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm having all this conflict with my staff and um, there's a lot of um, results that we can get within like, you know, one to three weeks, just in terms of, of focusing on some first princi principles in biology. Um, and then if you want, you know, the really sustained energy release, let's say, that's where you get into the mindset. And it, it, this comes back more to, you know, so we've got biology and then built on biology or part of biology is, you know, is the psychology. And the fact is that, um, and, and, you know, founders know this already, is that all things are created twice, right? So founders are generally visionary. So they have an idea of what it is that they want, right? And, and that's the first creation is that vision. And then the second creation is, well, it's doing it. So, mm -hmm. um, and founders often do that well for uh, their business. And, um, but the huge opportunity here is that they can actually do it for their entire life. So what I help them do is, is, you know, spend that time on that first creation, you know, who, who, um, who will you be in three years? And, you know, if you wanted to make it, you know, really urgent and maybe a little more bit is like, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Right. Because, you know, life is, is, is not, um, permanent i know we have a limited amount of time and so you know in as much as you're working on this goal it's let's ask ourselves who are we becoming and when you start to get into that dialogue and you know it probably sounds really intuitive and, and obvious um but it's just amazing how rare it is to get the time to actually think those things through right so being able to hold that space for a founder and to, like get them um you know to the crux of what it is that is inducing all this, you know, grace, greatness from them and who they want to be and who, what mark they really want to leave on the world. Um, that once you have that um, and, and you assign like some anchor points associated with that, like non-negotiables throughout your week, it's like, Hey, I want to be a good dad. So here's what I know is that like, <laughs> you know, every morning, you know, my wife and my daughter, you know, we have breakfast together in a certain way and we go for a walk and like that 45 minutes is sacred and it's non-negotiable. And, you know, right there, it's like everything starts to kind of fall around that. So, um, you know, there are things like that that every person has that are non-negotiables. And then we, we kind of start to pepper those non-negotiable things into the, into the framework of a week, a month, a year. And, um, you know, considering that in, the context of your vision for yourself three years out, then we move into the human performance planning. And so what I use in that regard is um, uh, periodization processes developed by Olympic coaches. So lucky for me, and when I worked with all these athletes, you know, looking into their DNA, I, I, like I said, I uh, interface with tens of thousands of athletes. I got to speak with hundreds of thousands of coaches, right. And actually mm -hmm. understand um you know, how it is that these forces are unleashed from, from human beings. And, you know, the truth is actually, I've been coaching high performers for well over 20 years, um, you know, first athletes and, um, and now entrepreneurs. So, so it's really about helping like the IRIS operating system is about helping, um, you know, entrepreneurs discover the answers that are already inside them through this three-step framework, biology, mindset, and performance planning. And um, yeah, that has been uh, one of the, it, that is one of the most, um, you know, instantly rewarding aspects of what I do. So like the DNA as a service, I mean, that's amazing because I know we're already seeing um, with sequencing.com, um, we're impacting hundreds of thousands, millions of people's lives. Um, but the IRIS operating system side of things is, well, I get to do the one-on-one -on -one, um, every day and and help well founders who again their their own initiatives are helping 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So yeah, really helping those people, you know, stay at optimum human potential, um, at a higher optimum human potential for longer uh, is is really what it's all about, right? So think about any any superhero role model, um, you know, that you admire, and and uh, wow, imagine if they had an extra ten years of lifespan and and performance longevity. Uh, so that's really what I'm what I'm fired up about with Iris operating system. I love it. I love it because um, the drawing the parallel between the uh, sports athlete. And uh, really, just the high the the high achiever mm -hmm. um, is. I, I think that's exactly on point, and I think that's also how I specifically approach my workouts, mm -hmm. um, and how I train. Uh, you know, I have a fitness com an online fitness community, and I think mm -hmm. that's actually what drives. Um, the way I speak, the way I coach also in the studio. And I really that it speaks to me in volumes. So mm -hmm. I love that. And I love the the parallel and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of challenges have you encountered in promoting the adoption of the DNA as a service? Mm -hmm. And if there are any, um, mm -hmm. and and I'm curious to know how you have addressed the challenges. Yeah, I think that um, I mean I, I mean I think back to my own personal journey um, previously with Athletogen. Um, there there was a lot of um, criticism around you know DNA and human performance. Uh, in so far as it's too early to use, um, you know, to predict these things. Um, then there's the, the challenge of like, oh, well, are you saying there are good genes and bad genes? Well, that's eugenics. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then, of course, there's the data privacy and security um, side of things. Yeah. So, well, I break those down. So, so are we, are we? Let's see them in reverse. So privacy and security, um, you know, that is, there's, you know, there's my way of doing things and, and, and then there's, then there's reality, right? So uh, there are various controls like, like, um, you know, the HIPAA controls that, and, uh, and, and um, HIPAA compliance that, Companies that I had used previously to, um, you know, independently audit to ensure that my security practices were were up to snuff, um, you know, at the, at the at the level above financial security and banks. So, like health information and privacy protection is basically what we're we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, making sure that you're surrounded with people who know um, the, the 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 technical. Uh, solutions for that and then also people who who know and understand the consequences of not being compliant so that that mm -hmm. is um you know first and in, in, in foremost on your your mandate it's like you you can't can't offer a service to you know athletes and you know their dna analysis and then have that be you know hacked by people who are writing their contracts for example and you know might choose to use that information against them um so that was a very real concern. And, and the way that I circumnavigated that was, as I just described, is having mm -hmm. people who know, that, who know that area and their expertise is, you know, far better than mine in that regard is in, in having that a critical part of my team. Um, the, there were, so there were three things that I said that there was, um, right, the eugenics um, aspect of it, good genes and bad genes. That's, I mean, that's been a problem um, since humanity you know it's anything that is not ourselves or or something that is um looks different is you know from an evolutionary perspective is perceived as a threat and nowadays it's potentially you know it's thought of as bad um mm -hmm. so you know if, if there is that kind of residual mind virus let's say um 
but you know, at, at the deeper level of um, are there good genes and are there bad genes? And 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 it, it, you know, I don't think anybody would say that Huntington's disease is good, right? Like I, I don't think that anybody would volunteer for that. But I, I think when we start to get into things like eye color and intelligence and you know all these traits that are you know that come together in very complex ways um and uh and, and their utility for let's say the good of humanity i mean it's it is really hard to say um you know so say for example you wanted a, um, a super intelligent um humanity let's say well how do you how do you define intelligence first of all well are we talking about logic structure well there might be a time when you know we need logic um but there might be other times where you need you know highly empathetic people right so so i think the way forward is actually you know it's it's um stephen jay gould who ha has always said it best as, as far as i can tell is is um so he's an evolutionary biologist he wrote um uh biology's irreducible essence is is variation so variation is bio, uh, biology irreducible essence and 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 our individual power comes from knowing where we fall on the variation right and and by the way it's like well variation in in in, in what respect well some of the things that we talked about before variation in terms of how i respond to drug to training mm -hmm. my vulnerability to this kind of training compared to that kind of training um, well, my, my, even <laughs> my music preferences potentially, um, but I don't know that those things can be unequivocally defined as, as good or bad. Right. So I think there's a real philosophical conversation that we as a humanity, um, need to have. And so I, you know, I think the solution for that is teaching genomics when, you know, as soon as kids can understand it, you know, like how, how did I come to be, you know, we don't, you don't need to wait, um, for high school to start teaching you know, genetics and genomics, um, so I, I think that's that's the solution. There is 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 education earlier um, around that idea that the irreducible essence of biology is variation. Um, and then the third thing was, well, it's too early. <laughs> and well, you can say that for just about anything, right? So you might say that about neuroscience. You might say that about exercise physiology. I mean, I mean we we learn, are learning so much more more and more every day and and i think now with ai models um you know compounding our you know that accelerated rate of discovery um you know i i am I'm, I'm i'm excited about what we're going to see between now and say 2030 but again the criticism was well you know at least as it relates to human um performance is like well we don't know enough um for for that to be to be you know, essentially sold. And it's like, well, define enough, right? Because um, <laughs> if I know that um, I have all these vulnerabilities in terms of how I make collagen, like, and, and that information can help me uh, with, with um, being more proactive about recovery. Um, I mean, even, even if it, even if it wasn't true, which, which it is true, um, you know, just that behavior is not bad. Um, you know, more regenerative type of work for athletes. So, so I think that um, the criticism that genomics came into, insofar as being too early, um, you know, is uh, is is one that it will be in for a long time because, you know, frankly, it's it's really only been in the last two or three years that people are really starting to get the utility from genomics mm. or for and well from dna um insights specifically um and i think that probably has a lot to do with just covid19 and people prioritizing health and looking at health differently interesting um, and 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 you know more citizen scientists and do it yourself um you know advocates for their own health but that's mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the solution that scales. I mean, I think it's it's great if you have the luxury um, to spend time getting to know yourself. But you know, what about the single mom? You know, who doesn't have that time? Doesn't she stand to to, to benefit from knowing that? Well, her daughter's lactose intolerant. Um, Absolutely. 
you know so so those are those are the things that that are ahead of us is it, it's incomplete information but i think it's good enough incomplete in, information so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Right. And, and why not use information that we do have in order to uh, help and better our own lives and others? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so that takes me right into uh, one more question of what role do you see education and public awareness playing in the advancement of DNA as a service and its integration into society? Because you yeah. you started touching on that in the in the previous uh, on the previous question. Yeah, you know it's um, it's almost like you wrote these questions and sent them to me before. <laughs> um yeah, but yeah no i i think that it's a good flow that we've got to and um it's uh that's an interesting one so what we're seeing what i'm seeing now is that there are you know all these initiatives that are that are happening like like basically there's there's um you know i see a lot of like collaborations with pharmaceutical companies um independent um you know biotech companies um and uh and you know with with academia in there as well and this is uh, you know oftentimes um overseen or sponsored by government grants um so you know there well the example like 23 me for example you you may or you may not know that you know the real business model behind 23 me is getting enough information about dna in the context of you know the the environment uh, so you know your phenotype let's say um so like if you're a 23 me user you you fill out your surveys and every time you do that you're giving 23 me um incredible predictive power um around how we might go about developing therapeutics to cure parkinson's disease it's not a bad thing um you know i i think where in some instances i do believe they've gotten some nih funding and they've done some peer-reviewed journaling and they have had uh, partnerships with Pfizer, I think, in the past. So, so that's a great example of 23 Media has proven the business model, and and in 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 insofar as hey, it's economically viable um, to do this research um, because well, we're gonna we're gonna create therapeutics, we're gonna cure disease, we're gonna take strain off um, public health. You know, it's a X trillion dollar crisis globally, ten plus, I think, at last check. So. Um, it, it, it makes good sense um, to to do it. I, I think that in today's climate around um, privacy, data security, like what we were speaking around there a few minutes ago, um, access to information, misinformation, trust. Like, do we do we trust our governments? Um, like, those are all you know, real issues to contend with in terms of public perception as it relates to how your most personal data is being handled, i.e. your DNA. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of, I kind of, you know, struggle with that, like my most personal data, my DNA. Well, yeah, but your behavioral data is, is the indication of how you're expressing that data, right? Th those two things go hand in hand. So the reality is, is that, you know, if you're on social media, um, you're on the internet, you use, you know, any of these platforms, Google, Facebook, whatever, there, there's, you've already been profiled, so to speak. Right. Um, so the cat's kind of out of the bag. And, and the genomics is just, you know, it's the extra layer to like really understand our biology. As a scientist, I'm like, wow, that's really exciting. Um, you know, but it's kind of like, you know, physicists who worked on splitting the atom were like, this is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but you gotta think, you gotta think about the unintended. Um, so, so yes, it's the benefits that are driving us forward for sure. For sure. We, we, we've got to, you know, pursue truth, pursue, uh, you use the scientific method to pursue truth, but we've also got to in parallel have, um, you know, open discussion around, well, what are the unintended consequences of, of doing this? And, you know, one of the things that has come up is, um, well, you know, discrimination based on genetics, you know, health insurance um, consequences, not getting a job. Um, 
so and then you get into genetic engineering like like these these things aren't impossibilities if you start to think 20 30 50 100 years from now and that's that's really it, is what do we want our species to look like a hundred years from now a thousand mm-hmm. years from now right i think you know long, long-termism is 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 it can be dangerous, but it can also be orienting, right? You know, so if you if you think too far out into the future, well, everything so seems so far away as it's it's a problem not worth addressing right now. But you know, ultimately we are kind of taking steps towards towards that future. So what do we want our species to look like a thousand years from now? Um I mean those are absolutely those are pretty- it's a very relevant yeah. question, uh, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, we have documentation of our species for, for, for that period of time, right? So we've seen, um, you know, certain things, certain cycles of, um, you know, human action and consequence, you know, as it relates to, um, you know, social unrest and wars and economic crisis and all these things. Um, we've never had the um, access to the amount of information we have access to today. Uh, nor have we had the ability to act on it in terms of like literally splicing our genomes. So like there, there are some pretty crazy things that you can, you can start to think about in terms of um, the, like genes, gene splicing or gene editing. And by the way, MRNA vaccines is, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. So there's, oh. there's in theory, all kinds of, you know, really interesting um, things that humans might do to accelerate um evolution and adaptation uh, with these with these um molecular tools uh, so to speak mm-hmm. so so i think um open conversation around that is critical i mean it's just like well you know how we've seen the same kind of um you know response from people like elon musk in terms of artificial intelligence it's like well we need to slow down before we speed up because um like i don't know is it AI the thing that's evil or is it just AI in the hands of you know amateurs that's dangerous or evil or potentially evil right so um I think there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen sooner rather than later and particularly the younger generation weighing in um and and you know developing you know principles and values around again what what humanity ought to be a thousand years from now Um, so many things that you have just said, um, hit home for me on, on like it would kind of circling back to how we started where I said, I'm, this is so refreshing to like, just talk to you about this stuff. And in, in this space that I'm in, uh, personally and, um, yeah, I think the way we are educating the younger generation is uh is very very important i think uh what you're saying about open discussion and uh, absolutely the universities have an obligation to talk about uh responsibility um ethics did you i wanted to ask you do you did you double major in philosophy and uh in and by biology yeah well you know what i i um it's funny when i started my undergrad i i was this close to doing a classics degree um so yeah i, I minored in philosophy um i, I double yeah. majored i double majored in molecular biology and biology and i minored in philosophy mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but philosophy is like it's like something you can never turn off right so it's like that's that's the stuff that you know i'm constantly reading on now you know like ethics and you know what what is our moral code moral compass and you know what is personal responsibility um like those are those are those are profound questions especially as a as a father like how are you you know teaching those things to the next generation so so yeah to answer your question yeah um so mm -hmm. yeah so on that note um i i feel like this is we're we're leaving our listeners with uh with a question and hopefully with a sense of responsibility mm-hmm. and um 
I, I thank you so much for coming on and talking about all this. You touched on uh, very deep issues. I love the connection between biology and philosophy because it showed up so often in our discussion just now. Mm. And, um, and yeah, keep doing what you're doing. And mm. I'm going to ask you to come on to the show like another... 500 times so we can keep keep this discussion going well i would i would love that um and you know the interesting thing is you know to your your point around um like education and continuing education um actually something i'm launching next year is um a, a podcast actually around those three pillars of biology mindset and performance planning um because okay. you know any, anything that i'm speaking about is something that I've learned from somebody else. And so um, one of the things that always bothered me as an academic, for example, is, you know, you get all this government issued research funding and you get to do your cool science and you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily accountable in terms of like how that's paid back um, to, to um, well, for me and Canadian citizens. So, um, but, you know, the interesting thing is the more academics that I talk to is the more they they want to they do want to talk about it. Um, they do want a chance to talk about their research. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm you know, essentially engaged, a, you know, a lineup of around 100 or so um, subject matter experts that I've classified into those buckets, biology, mindset, performance, um, just to kind of dialogue around those subjects and, and bring a lot of these um, cutting edge insights um, that might normally take 10 years to get to the mainstream, um, you know, bring them to the, the mainstream. Beautiful. Population. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Awesome. So, Amazing. so, I'll tell so you, I'm going to, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be a listener. That's for sure. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Dr. Koenig. Thank you so much. And uh, where you are, it's uh, the middle of the day right? It is. Yes. Okay. So enjoy the rest of your day. And, um, oh, and before I, do you have Instagram? You know what? I, I don't, um, I have, okay. um, you can find me on LinkedIn. So just Jeremy. That, that's yeah, that's fine. It's just that I, um, I have a large following on Instagram. So, mm -hmm. uh, when I post, I post there, but I will also, um, I will also post on LinkedIn. Cool. Yeah. And the, the podcast website uh, will be uh, drjeremykonick.com. Oh, the, um, is that already, is that already live? The web, the website it's, itself? It's it's not live yet, but it will be in, you know, next six weeks. Oh, okay. So you know what, when it is, mm -hmm. um, please send me the link so I can link it to the show notes. Will do. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you.